Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Roman World, in which the future is so bright for Rome, I have to wear shades. Actually, no, my head's exploding because there's weather coming into Baltimore, so shades. <clears throat> All right, so let us talk about, ah, hello, kitty, regime change and Tethys. Say hello to the students, Tethys. Yes. As I teased last week, we're going to talk about why it is that Rome decided that kings were a horrible, horrible bad idea and that they needed to begin experiments in uh, representative democracy. And this was your reading for today. And as I mentioned, this is going to get difficult and gnarly because this is an incident that Romans felt to be so problematic, so horrific that it required regime change. So this is another story that's very, very old in the Roman state, but also one that modern historians have begun to reevaluate in the context of Roman archaeology. Uh, we notice patterns happening in settlement around Rome as we get into this period in Roman history, that is around the year 509-510 BCE, Probably not coincidentally, this is also about the time that Cleisthenes reforms are underway in Athens, making Athens into a democracy. So this is a new wave of government structure that's sweeping the Mediterranean region writ large. Rome isn't the only Mediterranean city to participate in this kind of government either. Another early adopter, Carthage. Mm hmm. You'll see why I'm saying it in that tone of voice next week. So what we begin to see is that more and more people are moving into urban areas. And we also start to see names popping up in inscriptions that we recognize from later periods of uh, Roman inhabitation from these founding families. So what seems to be happening is that elite families are coming together in order to share power in this urban market center. And what may be going on behind the story that we get from Livy is that the kings are kicked out uh, maybe not so much because the king screwed up, but because noble families decided it was in their best interests to get rid of the kings so they could share a larger percentage of the 1% or one spoils. Either way, that's a going theory, but a lot of this is unprovable because the records are just so scanty from this period. We'll talk about why there is scanty records in lecture 3b. So this is our next big character to pop up in Roman history, where we're looking at a bust of him now in bronze. This is Lucius Junius Brutus, the ancestor of another Brutus that you've probably heard of, if you've heard of a Brutus. This is the guy who uh, stabs Julius Caesar to death, that Brutus. Yeah, this is his great 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 grandfather and that's what I mean by noble families whose names start showing up and repeating at this early history. So just like we have Eulus uh, and the Julian clan showing up in early Roman mythology, so too the Brutus name is popping up. So we've got to talk about Roman names because Roman names work in a way that's very different from American names, but they're quite regular and knowing how they work will help you keep track of who is who beginning in this period. So we're going to start with the tria nomina system, which is just Latin for three names. So this is the basic unit of a Roman guy's name. And only the first two names are really necessary. So the prinomen is your first name, and there's a very limited set of these. It's kind of like most Romans are named Bob, only instead of Bob, it's Marcus. So Marcus, Caius, Quintus, Tiberius, Titus, Sextus. There's this really regular set of about 12 first names that Roman dudes have. And they're so common that Romans will abbreviate them. So sometimes instead of seeing Marcus written out, you'll see M period, Lucius is L period, uh, Caius as in 
Caius Julius Caesar's C period. And you might have heard this Roman name in another form. The earliest Arthurian legends are set in the years after Roman control officially withdraws from the island of Britain. And one of the first knights of the round table is Sir Kay or Sir Caius. Kai, the name is from Caius, and you might know a Kai, that's this name. Also like Guy in French, G-U-Y, Guy, Guy, that's this name. So it's an old one and one that Julius Caesar had for what it's worth. Uh, a fan favorite is Sextus, named after Sextilis, the sixth month of July because of calendar reasons. And this is abbreviated S-E-X period. And you c I got in trouble once in high school for writing this on something and not specifying that I was doing my Latin homework. Oh, high school, it's a fun time. All right, so that's the Prynomen. The Nomen is the name of your big family branch. So this is an ancestral name shared by many, many, many people in your family. And by people, I mean both men, women, and others. If you're a dude, then you have the version of this that ends in us. So Julius in Gaius Julius Caesar, the Julius is his nomen, that's his family name. It's the same way that we use last names today. In Rome, it's your middle name. If you're a woman in this society, then your name is your nomen in the feminine form. And that's it. So if you have a sister, and you're Julius Caesar's daughter, your name is also Julia. So you'll have Julia and Julia, they're both Julia. And the obvious problems are, well, like many people have more than one daughter. So what do you do? In that case, they either number them. So you'll have like Julia Prima, Julia Secunda, Julia Tertia. So Julia one, Julia two, Julia three. Sometimes they'll use physical features like uh, Julia Rubra is Julia the Redhead, and you'll have like uh, Julia Fusca, uh, Julia with the more melanin. And occasionally you'll also get layers of nomina. So um, sometimes if your mother's from a famous family, then you'll get to keep that one too. So you might be like Yula, Julia Papaya, and that's an okay name. When you marry, you do not change your name. This is one thing the Romans kind of have on us here. It's you never change your name, even if you're in a very conservative form of marriage. You still keep your family name as a woman. So you will use your husband's name as a way of differentiating yourself. So if you're Julia of the Balbini, you're a Julia who's married into the Balbinus family, but that's like not your last name. It's just a way of being more specific. This system falls apart really quickly. By the time we get into the first century BCE, women are having longer names. They're also including nicknames with their names. And by the time you get into the early empire, you're getting long streams of women's names as they you know, take their family nickname and use it as part of their formal name. But somewhere in that name, you're gonna have the nomen, and that's how you tell what family somebody's from. However, families have a tendency to get bigger, and then as you end up having more senior men in a family, the family will split off into branches. It's a patrilineal society, so if you have, say, three brothers, and each of them end up being like the older heads of a whole family, eventually that family is going to get too unwieldy and it'll split into branches which is where the cognomen comes in. So the cognomen starts as a nickname that eventually becomes a family name for the branch because often siblings, if they're men, they'll still have a similar name. Some families only have like one or two prinomena they use. So for instance, Cicero, his brother's name was also Cicero. He was just Quintus Cicero. And then the Cicero is Marcus Cicero. Uh, it's a famous order. You don't have to remember him yet. In other families, though, everybody was Marcus. Everybody. No matter how many brothers you had, they'd all be Marcus. For instance, if you were a Cato, you would be Marcus Cato, son of Marcus Cato, grandson of Marcus Cato. And your five brothers would also be Marcus Cato. 
what to do. Well, just like with women, you'd start to have nicknames. And these nicknames would begin based on physical features, characteristics, irritating tics, habits, things like that. And I'm going to give you two examples. Cicero, or Cicero, that's how you pronounce it in Latin, that order dude I was mentioning earlier. So his full name is um, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Tullius is his family name. Cicero is his family branch because one of his ancestors had a big wart on his nose that looked like a chickpea, which is Cicero in Latin. So the family name was Cicero after the dude with the chickpea nose. And that that was fine. Like Nobody felt insecure about it. They took it as a point of pride. These could get quite silly, but not everybody took the silliness well. So let's talk about Julius Caesar, because Julius Caesar was really super insecure about his name for reasons I will get into here. So Gaius Julius Caesar, right? Gaius is his prinomen. Gaius or Caius. C and G were the same letter in Latin. In the Middle Ages, G is invented. Uh, don't worry about it too much. Julius, from Eulus, his hero ancestor, that's his family name. But then his branch of that family, because it's a really old family, it's got a lot of branches. So the Caesares, there's some debate about where this cognomen came from. Julius Caesar would like you to believe that it's from Caido Caidera to cut or to slice, as in like to, you know, stab your enemies a lot although that's super ironic in retrospect, isn't it? Um, there's a family legend that one of Caesar's ancestors, not Caesar himself, because his mother was alive, uh, but one of his ancestors was born by a cesarean section. Back in the day, women did not survive this procedure. There are no blood transfusions. You're just not. It was a last ditch effort if the mother was dead or dying and they wanted to see if they could save the baby. Apparently, um, one of Caesar's ancestors may have been born this way, but we only have this from one author, and even that author's like, uh, look, this is just a story, I don't know. The more likely one, and I like it in part because Caesar hated people bringing this up, was from Caesares, meaning hairy, like lots of hair. So wh why did Julius Caesar find this to be a problem. Well, Julius Caesar, when he was about 19, started going bald. And going bald wasn't just like a cosmetic problem for ancient people, although certainly men did body shame each other over going bald too early. But they believed that you went bald because you were having too much sex. They thought, um, for reasons I won't get into too much here, but if you're interested, take ancient medicine. But they believed that men, if they um, ejaculate too much, it pulls the vital essence out of their head and causes their hair to turn gray and fall out. And this was something men got shamed for a lot. It was considered a sign of sex addiction, it meant you were out of control. And Caesar did not help this by having a reputation as a wife stealer. In his early career, one of the ways he got back at his political opponents was, well, stealing their wives and boyfriends. Uh, he had a rather famous affair with Nicomedes of Bithynia at one point. He didn't get shamed for that, by the way, because he had an affair with the man. He got shamed for it because allegedly he was the bottom. So... For these reasons and more, Caesar really hated people bringing up his bald head, like really hated it so much so that at one point he got the right to wear his triumphant crown, like uh, winning military victories got you the right to wear a wreath on your head all the time and not just at special occasions. And he got this right in part because it held his comb over down so people wouldn't make fun of his bald head to his face so much. This stop nobody from making fun of him being bald. In fact, that kind of accelerated the bullying. And I'm not saying bullying's okay, but I'm really not very motivated to defend Julius Caesar from anything because frankly, um, well, 
<laughs> he's Julius Caesar and he's uh, a really loathsome person, but not because he's bald. Bald people are amazing. At any rate, the point of this is when you see Romans out in nature, the important part of their name to look for is the nomen, because that'll tell you a little bit about who their ancestors are and also who their descendants are. And this is going to be really helpful when we get to Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, Julius Caesar's adopted heir and the first emperor of Rome. All right. So all of that out of the way, now let's talk about the fall of the monarchy. Now, a quick tour of the periods in question. So 753 is the uh, putative date of the founding of Rome. And this was the year that Romans dated everything from. So Romans didn't use BCE and CE because they didn't know who Jesus was, especially not before Jesus was born. Also, Jesus was born in five or four BCE. so that dating system's a little inaccurate too. At any rate, Romans dated things from 753 BCE, the founding of the city. Sometimes they also throw in Olympiads there as a way of doing international dating systems. At any rate, the regal period at, ends in 509 BCE with the events we're going to discuss in this lecture, and then begins a period that modern historians call the Republic. And I emphasize modern historians because ancient people um, are a little uneven in the way they refer to this period, in part because of the name. In Latin, the word that gives us republic is res publica. Publica gives us public in English. It just means common, um, public versus private. And then res is their word for stuff business. So res publica just means public business. It's the Latin word for a government. Any government is res publica. And they called their government the res publica when it had kings. They called it the res publica when they had emperors. But eventually, ancient historians and later modern historians begin referring to this period where there aren't kings and there aren't emperors, where instead the state is being ruled by a combination of citizen assemblies and the Senate as the Republic or the res publica. The main themes of this period are internal and external conflicts, uh, which is very generic, isn't it? There are class conflicts ongoing. So the Republic doesn't emerge fully formed from the ashes of the monarchy. Instead, there are a series of changes made as different elements of the society lobby successfully in order to have better representation in the government and more access to positions of power and influence and money, because you know money's important here. This is also a period where more and more people begin to fight, not just to keep Rome out, but be, to be let in to Roman enfranchisement. One of the things that Rome does that is pretty brilliant, not necessarily unique, but pretty brilliant, is they begin expanding citizenship fairly early on to include Italians in city-states other than Rome proper. And likely this begins even under the kings or the, the regal period when you have these wealthy landowning families coming to Rome as a market town. Their alliance in this market town doesn't depend on them being from that market town. It just relies on them coming together to trade in this area. And if they can come to join into the Rome project. More people can come in and join the Rome project. So it's really baked into the system from the get-go. And this mythology of immigrants gaining insider status serves to make this feel durable and traditional and okay. It certainly doesn't stop people from getting very snarky about the latest people to be enfranchised, but it certainly does make the situation a bit more open than elsewhere in the Mediterranean. Eventually, this leads into runaway expansion for reasons we'll get into in Lecture 3b. And with that runaway expansion comes further widening of 
citizen rights, but also of exploitative economies. And this creates further conflicts culminating in this unit with the Punic Wars. So that's where we're going with this. Rome's gonna go to war with Carthage. Rome wins, sorry. Kinda like Carthage too. So 31 BCE is a convenient start point for the imperial period, but again, this doesn't arrive wholly formed any more than the Republic does. Bit by bit by bit. A society that swore they would never have a king again, who told themselves stories about why kings are always bad and why we're going to have to, like, get together as a mob and kill anybody who even thinks about being kings. Uh, eventually, it ends up being an absolute autocracy with an emperor at the head. But this process takes over a century from the first emperor to the emperor becoming a durable feature of the constitution. And that's the other lesson from Rome that I find interesting to think with. A republic takes a lot of work, and you don't wake up one day with a lost republic. There are a lot of places where you can turn that around. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at how this process played out on the Roman stage and think about what, if any, lessons this has for us. There we go. Okay, so just to set ourselves up here, these are the last kings of Rome. I've put them on the list for you so that while you're reading Livy, you can kind of have the names so you know who they're talking about. The ones that are important to us for this story uh, well, one's really the last one, is Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. This is the last king of Rome. This is the dude who ruins it. And really, it's not quite him who ruins it. It's his kid. This is one of the things that Romans find objectionable about monarchy. And when they tell the story, part of what they're telling themselves is the problem with monarchs is that they have entitled kids who do horrible things because they believe that they're special and different and above the law. So this is gonna be a story that Romans told to remind themselves of out of control entitlement and the human cost it entails. This is not meant to be a happy story. Romans found none of this okay, except maybe the driving the kings out part. But, it's a story that makes for difficult reading all the same. As the name might suggest, Superbus is Latin for the proud. So this was already a king with a bit of an attitude problem. And this is in a line of kings that had already had a king called Hostilius. So like, this is the king who was worse than the king named Hostile, literally named Hostile. Uh, and his son, Sextus Tarquinius is, well, equally aptly named, but for reasons we'll get into. Now, the person around whom this tragedy revolves is a woman named Lucretia. Lucretia's husband was away fighting with all of the other Roman soldiers at the time at the Siege of Veii. So on our map, I'm going to use dark blue for this. So here's Rome right here. And then across the Tiber River is Veii, which is this town right in Etruscan territory. So this is Rome's first foothold into Etruria, certainly not its last. Uh, this is an area that by now was integrated a little bit into Rome. Some of Rome's kings had been Etruscans, some of them have been Sabines. The Sabines now were fully integrated into Rome, so this early process of integration and enfranchisement was already underway. But it's not a peaceful process by any means, and the Siege of Veii is ground zero for this kind of thing. So the Romans are across the river Tiber, they're laying siege to Veii, and they're really bored this one night. Sieges are boring. You sit outside the walls and just basically wait for people inside the city to get bored and starve. So the Romans start talking to each other, and for some reason, gosh knows why, they're like, whose wife is the most virtuous wife? And they're all like bragging on how virtuous their wives are. And Tarquinius Colatinus is like, 
oh guys, now my wife is virtuous and I will prove it. Let's, you know, it's after dark, the siege is fine, like nobody's gonna notice if we're gone for a night. So let's like go back to Rome and see what our wives are doing right now. And I bet you that my wife is doing the most virtuous wife stuff. So they go back across the Tiber, they sneak into Rome, and everybody's wife is hanging out together at this wife party where they're all like drinking wine and having a good time because their husbands are gone, gosh darn it, and it's their night off. Except for one, Lucretia is at home with uh, her enslaved staff, and all of them are busy spinning wool and weaving clothing for their absent soldier husbands. So Lucretia wins the prize of most virtuous wife in Rome because she's doing her domestic labor when her husband isn't watching, I guess. Uh, so Sextus Tarquinius, the king's son, takes from this object lesson uh, this takeaway. Lucretia's hot and I want to sleep with her. So what he does next, and this is where this gets very disturbing, is he comes back the next night under cover of dark into Lucretia's house, knowing that she's going to be there working, corners her in her bedroom, holds her at sword point and says, look, you're going to have sex with me now, or I'm going to kill one of the enslaved men in this household and put him in bed with you, and then I'm going to kill you, and then it's going to look like you've been cheating on your husband with one of your enslaved people. And Lucretia's, Lucretia is like, okay, fine. And so Sextus Tarquinius rapes her leaves and then the next day she writes to her husband she's like get down here now and here's what happens next uh, so this is a woodcut from the 1500s showing this next scene which is uh, where things get even more depressing so Tarquinius Collatinus the husband and his cousin Lucius Junius Brutus get together in the house and Lucretia says to them okay guys this is what happens this is what Sextus did and then her relatives are just horrified they're like oh my god Lucretia don't blame yourself you're not responsible for this you did not do this you were raped you said no no means no and like for once, the Roman dudes, yay, good job. Um, and that's the last win we get in this story because then freaking Lucretia, uh, sorry, I shouldn't be mad at her. She's traumatized. You know. She says, yeah, yeah, I know it's not my fault, guys. Thank you. But, and here's the bit I am not signing off on, but I do want to give you warning before you run it, it into it in the reading. She says, I don't want anybody to pretend to be raped and then use me as an excuse so i'm gonna kill myself anyway and then her her men folk are like no no don't but she's too fast and she dies and then tarquinius collatinus and lucius junius brutus are like this is freaking unacceptable we can't have this happen anymore the kings have gotten out of control the king's son is a monster no way in hell we are going to let these people be in charge of our city-state so uh, a movement spearheaded by lucius junius brutus drives the kings out of rome interestingly they don't kill them they just exile them and this leads to some trouble for brutus down the road his kids decide that they'd rather have the king actually so brutus ends up uh killing them for treason so this ends up very poorly for brutus but brutus gets the title of um the founder of the republic and the killer of kings and at this point with the king gone all of the land that used to be the king's land which included a lot of farmland downtown real estate in rome the king had all this nice stuff that now these upper class families, the patres, the town fathers, or the patricians, split it amongst themselves. They take all of this state land and they make it private for themselves. So this republic thing works out great for them. They, however, do not split up the land amongst the small landholding citizens of Rome, 
which brings us to our next movement in Roman constitutional history. I'm so sorry, Lucretia, you deserve better than this. But uh, this is a story that, especially in the Renaissance, gets heavily fetishized. And that's how you end up with people named Lucrezia, like Lucrezia Borgia, who did much better for herself, frankly. Okay, so that's it for the difficult rape and suicide bits of this story. Now let's talk about constitutional makeup. The Senate existed before the kings were driven out. It's one of the first bits of the state to be founded. According to legend, uh, I think it's Romulus who first convenes the Senate. And it's a word derived from the Roman word for an old man, senex. It's the same thing that gives us senile in English, but also Senate. The Senate is supposed to be the gathering of old men who advise the running of the state. So this starts as a council of elders and continues to sort of be a council of elders but in the republic you don't get to be in the senate just because you're old and you're from a specific family you have to have held elected office in the state once you've held elected office then you're a member of the senate we're looking now at what remains of the senate house built by the emperor augustus so that's what this is you can still see it in the roman forum the inside of it though you can't see but it looks like this so the roman senate doesn't look like an amphitheater although sometimes they did meet in theater spaces especially when the senate house was kind of run down and essentially condemned it was so manky you couldn't meet in it anymore so they'd meet in temples and people's houses and eventually Pompey's theater so if, if they're in a theater space that's where they are but when they're in the senate house proper it should look like this a little bit more like the english house of parliament where you have a a thin floor down the middle whoever's presiding sits up front here and there's an altar so that you can make offerings to as part of the senate proceeding and then the more important you are the closer you sit to this bottom row so least important people up here almost most important people here and mosty mosty important people right there so let's talk about who's important uh, before that though we also have to talk about the populos so sometimes you'll see the abbreviation spqr this is what romans called their government and government system and it's short for the senate and the people of rome quay is latin for and and then senate populus romai that makes sense enough in English that you can see where the rest of it is. The Senate's only a small part of this government. The other part are the people, the body of male free citizens who vote in various configurations on all sorts of things. So this isn't just like the United States where we vote on our elected representatives and that's about it. But assemblies are also voting on policy. They vote on who goes to war with whom, who's in charge of the war that you just declared on whoever. So a really wide range of things are laws that everybody votes on, sort of like referendum issues, only they're happening a lot more frequently than every two or four years. At their height, there are multiple assemblies held in the same year and these get very very large with a lot of people coming into town for them now romans used this abbreviation to mark state property it's a tag that you see in ancient roman graffiti so they put it on coinage they put it on government buildings they put it on sidewalks they put it on covers of the sewer system <laughs> you know spqr shows up everywhere and it's still something that modern day romans will put in the city of rome because this is still a Romany tagline that's survived the existence of Rome as a state. Let's count the Vatican, which uh, is pushing it. Okay, so here's what the government structure looks like. And this inverted pyramid is showing you not 
power in terms of number, but in terms of authority and responsibility. So the, the fewest people are in the green zone at the top of this pyramid, the consuls. The Senate is even fewer people, like a tiny, tiny, less than 1% of Romans are in the Senate. It's super exclusive, kind of like the modern Senates, like what percentage? Uh, however, the demographic breakdown of billionaires in the Senate is consistent. <clears throat> and then the assembly has by far the most people. So this is the assembly of all of the citizens. But because power is diffuse, it doesn't have as much voting authority. This, the assembly on issues can basically say yes or no. They can't draft legislation unless they're an office holder of some kind. And they can't participate in official debate in the same way that senators and elected officials can. So that's why they're the small bit of the triangle. But they're also quite numerous, and they can sway the government against the will of both the consuls and the Senate. Now, the consuls are at the top. These are two elected officials. They're elected annually, so they serve just one year. And originally, that's a term limit. Your consul wants, and then you have to get out. Eventually, this breaks down a bit, but we're not there yet. And there are two of them as a form of check and balance. The idea is that if you just have one consul, that's way too much like a king. And we can't have that because kings will have kids and their kids will rape your wives. So if we have two consuls, then if one consul starts looking like an abusive asshat, then the other consul can stop him, theoretically. This works better in theory than in practice, but it's theory. And because they're only in power for a year, they don't have enough time to really get entrenched in the way a king can. They're kind of in, they're out. So it's a way of mitigating the sort of power a king has and keeping kings from happening again, which is the guiding principle of this whole system is no kings, no kings ever. We'll see how this works out for Rome but not quite yet. Now, one of the first bits of pushback that the Roman state got on this brand new power share plan was from the plebeian class. So this is a quote from Dionysus of Halicarnassus. This is an outside observer. He's a Greek speaker. Halicarnassus is in modern day Turkey. So he's writing from the outside about the Roman constitution. And that's kind of helpful for us because Romans sometimes don't explain things very well because they assume we're Romans if we're reading Latin. So we know Greek speakers not so much. They're explaining things a bit. So the patricians are from these old powerful families who are urban based. They work in professional educated kind of jobs like um, government officials, uh, lawyers and judges are also this like the lawyers are also the magistrates who are also the judges. So it looks like three professions, but it's it's not. This is just what upper class people do. The plebeians in this early stage of the government and not very early, mind you, we're talking 400s BCE. These are the folks who aren't living in downtown Rome. So these are the people who are small landowners. They are still citizens, they're still freeborn, but they're herding livestock, they have uh, seasonal occupations, they have to spend a lot of their day-to-day -day time on agriculture and livestock. This means that they can't just drop everything and go to Rome to run the state. And this means that they're naturally a little disenfranchised. They can't always show up for the assemblies. However, they're also cut out from the system of power that's redistributing wealth at an increasing rate to the patricians. And they see a problem with this. They feel like the Roman state is being set up in such a way as to cut them out to keep them from taking on positions of responsibility and authority and to thus keep them from ever getting into a higher socioeconomic bracket. So what to do? 
This leads us to a period we sometimes call the struggle of the orders. Order here is the word that Romans use when they're talking about, are you a patrician or a plebeian? That's Latin ordo. In English, we say order. So the plebeians major beefs with the situation at the beginning of the Republic are as follows. So I'm just going to tick them off on this list. It's also on the slide, so you can look this up later. There is a question about this. This is important. Okay. Originally, there were limits on the kinds of magistracies, that is public offices they could hold, so they were barred from ever being the consul or even you know, slightly less high but still high government positions they thought that was a problem like if they can't be president then what's the point next up this public land i was mentioning the stuff that used to belong to the kings and then gets divided up amongst patricians but also some of that land gets left public however patricians monopolized land access and this is really important if you're making your living in livestock because livestock can't just be kept on one plot of land if you have large numbers of them you have to move your herds to where there's grass and this often involves going up into the apennines and then down depending on the season of the year and if you're not allowed to take your animals onto public land that hurts your bottom line this restricts the kinds of ways that you can do business and in early room this is a real problem because they used to be allowed to go on the king's land so not being allowed to go on this land all of a sudden, that's a big deal. And I would be horked off too if this was supposed to be my government and yet now I can't like graze my animals on the public green. Next up is taxation. Interestingly enough, I'm, I'm sure this surprises all of you immensely. It's my sarcastic voice. The Patricians gave themselves lower taxes than they gave to the plebeians. Their reasoning was that they were already spending all of this extra time running the government. And so therefore the plebeians should, because they're not spending as much time running the state, they should give a greater percentage of their income to taxes. And that would be their contribution to the government. Really the patricians, you know, they don't want to be in charge. It's just, you know, this thing they have to do so horrible and the plebeians are like we'll hold office C can we be elected we'd like to hold office instead of paying lots and lots of taxes and the patricians are like oh no honey you don't need to do that and they're like oh the heck we do and next up the income the taxation inequality wasn't just taxation of money but it was also taxation in the form of military service. So people from the plebeian class were expected to serve longer parts of the year, more frequently in the military. And they were also put into positions in the military where they were at far greater bodily risk. They also, in this early period, you had to pay for your own armor. So this was also a class that couldn't afford good armor and they were being put in the front of the army. More about that when we talk about Roman expansion. And plebeians had a problem with that. They're like, okay, so let me get this straight. We stand in the front, our armor isn't as good, and we get killed more because we're poor. And the patricians are like, yeah, yeah that's the idea. The plebeians are like, no. Uh, the next problem and this is a big one, was debt structures. In this early period, debt could include enslavement if you default on your loans, not just enslavement for you, but for your family. And it was becoming quite common for people to sell their children into slavery in order to cover their debt. And wouldn't you know, this debt was often owned by patricians who just happened to have all of this extra money to loan out. And do you see where this is going? So the plebeians were like, this is messed up. So you're keeping us from making money. And then you're also getting us into even more debt that you're making us sell our kids in order to pay off so our kids can work for you for free. And this is okay. Why now? We're citizens. You're not supposed to enslave citizens. You're supposed to enslave foreigners. God. Ah, yeah, class warfare was 
still working out some of its kinks. So finally, there was a ban on intermarriage with the patricians. So not only were you closed out of ever running for these offices or getting access to greater wealth or more land rights or not getting killed so much in war, but also you couldn't even like marry a patrician to get to be a patrician. Oh no, your marriage would be illegal. So this made it so that there, there's just literally no way to get patrician level rights. And plebeians thought that that was not okay. And this leads to one of the earliest, um, not, not even the earliest, no, this is going on as early as the Bronze Age, but an incident of collective bargaining in the ancient world. So this is sometimes called the um, secession of the plebs. Basically, the plebeians go on strike. They leave Rome en masse, and they hole up on, I think, the Aventine Hill at one point, and they're like, fine, we're going to found our own republic, and we're going to be over here, and good luck buying your meat, because we own the means of production, you patrician asshats. At this point, the patricians are like, no, no, you mad bro, come back, please, we'll give you stuff. And this leads to a couple of major developments. I'm going to focus on the two big ones. First, the plebeians not only gained the right to run for public offices eventually, and this took several rounds of striking and negotiating and striking, but they got their very own office, an office that people who weren't of the plebeian class couldn't run for. So this was a plebeian only thing in the Roman government called the Tribune of the Plebs. Uh, plebs is another word for plebeian. It's, it's the same word in Latin. A tribune is a person in the government who has one job and one constitutional power. Oh, but it's a doozy. They have the right of veto. So by veto, I mean a tribune at any time can stand up in any government proceeding and can shout the word veto, which is the Latin word for I forbid it. And at that point, whatever they're doing, no matter what it is they're doing, they have to stop and they can't do it for the rest of the business day. And then the next day they have to try to do it again. And the Tribune can stand up and be like veto again. And that can happen again and again and again until the plebeians get what they want. So my goodness, this is a ridiculously awesome superpower to have. If you're going to have a constitutional power, it, this one's a little bit like being a superhero with invisibility. It's just great. So if you're wondering then, well, why didn't they just murder the tribunes? That's one of the first things that the tribunes thought of too. Tribunes had one constitutional right. Um, so their constitution or power was the veto. Their constitutional right was that their person, their body was sacrosanct in the same way a vestal virgin was sacrosanct. You cannot raise your hand in violence against a tribune. You can't even touch them in a hostile way. You can't even like almost poke them but not quite make contact and be like, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching Like even that is a little, that's aggressive. You can't do that. Their body is sacrosanct and to kill a tribune is to insult the gods. You slap a tribune, you slap the face of the immortal gods. This didn't stop tribunes from always getting murdered, but it did work out for most of the most of the time. There is surprisingly little tribune murder, at least for a while. We'll pick up that thought as we move ahead. So that's the tribune of the plebs. There are 12 of them eventually. And no, that's all I'll say about it now. So you have 12 at any time. It's a one year office, just like consul. And this also becomes an entry level position. So once you've been tribune, you can continue to rise through the ranks and eventually become consul. So this is a, a really great concession and it worked out great for the plebs. The next one, eventually the plebeians lobbied for and were granted a code of laws. So in the early days, Rome didn't have a written body of law, but law codes were becoming very trendy, even as the Roman Republic was being founded. 
in fact, in the centuries before that, they had been invented and then spread like wildfire through the Eastern Mediterranean. So Rome was on trend for this too. But by having written laws, and these were written laws that were posted on 12 large bronze tablets in the center of town, so everybody could see them, everybody could read them, everybody knew what they were, and everybody was bound by them. So this was a first step in equality under a written law that had to be changed through voting processes. So this is a pretty good one. And in order to make it, Rome elected this 10-man committee who draft up the 12 tables. Now, we can't reconstruct the 12 tables. Eventually, other laws were passed and these laws became obsolete. We kind of know what some of them are because some Romans mention individual laws. They seem to be mostly bound up with property rights. There's also an intriguing one where it was illegal to curse your neighbor's crops using an evil incantation. Just so you know. So like, no agricultural witchcraft in early Rome. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> Interestingly enough, these 10 lawgivers go off the rails and end up uh, one of them becomes a sexual predator and they have to be deposed, which becomes another story Romans tell themselves about why power is so gosh darn dangerous, that power eventually leads to exploitation and literal rape. So this is an ongoing thing with Romans. They become quite fanatical about kings. Which means that if you ever want to get a mob to turn on someone in Republican Rome, you accuse them of wanting to be a king. I hope that's useful to you. But th this is good news. Let's not soil this good news. So eventually, this works out well for plebeians. By the time we get to the first century BCE, so about the time of Julius Caesar, plebeians on average, you're making about as much money as patricians. In fact, a lot of patricians are impoverished with really famous names, but not a lot of funds. And many of the families have either died out or married into plebeians. So there's not a lot of effective difference between patricians and plebeians at that stage. But being a patrician still has some perks. There's certain priesthoods you have to be a patrician to get into, and the chief priest, the Pontifex Maximus, has to be a patrician. Like Julius Caesar, he's a patrician. Go him. Okay, so here is that pyramid again, now with people broken down by their ordo, by their social class. So a certain number of patricians had to be in the Senate, and it was a little bit over half. This was an overrepresentation compared to the general Roman populace. Most Roman people fell into the plebeian class. So in the citizen assembly, if you broke it down by its, its fraction, you end up with the patricians here in this kind of blue-violet color and everybody in purple, that's the plebeians. Now the tribunes, they're all plebeians. Uh, this diagram has them at 10, eventually they're 12, just go with it. The senators, um, this is around 264 BCE, so this is at the beginning of the Punic Wars, about the end of week three's material. Mm, senators are about evenly split, but you know, slightly weighted towards um, the patricians. Like if we had a a quarter of a Roman, we'd, we'd have this here. The consuls had to have one patrician and one plebeian for balance. But you'll notice that even in this this breakdown, the patricians still have unequal and disproportionate representation in the Senate, and they have one of the consuls who does have quite a lot of power. More about the consuls in a minute. In fact, I, I can't remember if I talk about this on the next page, so I'll, so I'll tell you now. The consuls are one of a set of offices with a constitutional right to imperium. So imperium is the word that gives us empire in English, but what it means for a Roman 
is the power of life and death. This means that a consul can order the death of a Roman citizen, and a consul can also pardon a Roman citizen within a certain boundary. The consuls need this power because they're in charge of the military. They're a combination between the commander in chief and sort of an executive officer. The office of the American president is based off of the consul, except there's just one of him. Okay, so about this sequence of offices. Uh, this diagram still has the divide between patricians and plebeians. On the main ladder, so the straight run going from the dude in the toga on the bottom to the dude in the toga with the stripe at the top, that's the main cursus honorum or sequence of honors. And this is the order in which you have to hold office in order to rise up through the ranks. Most of these steps you can't skip. We'll talk about the one you can skip moving ahead. There is, however, a side ladder for plebeians only. So this blue side is the plebeians only side, and the main ladder is either plebeians or patricians. Okay. There are minimum age qualifications for all of these offices. And if you manage to be elected for your office the first year that you're eligible to run, then they call this being elected suo anno, or in your own year. And this was the icing on the cake. It didn't give you any actual power, but it was a bragging point that Romans will not shut up about if they manage to hit this. And they get very proud of this, especially if they're the first person in their family to get into the cursus honorum, because that's a big deal. It's unusual because most of the people who get into this ladder are people whose fathers and grandfathers and uncles and so on were there before them. This isn't a system where you get a lot of people breaking in, but you do get some, enough to give people hope. And that's pretty good for ancient world politics. Okay. At the very bottom rung, you have the quaestor. So that's this guy down here. A quaestor is a financial officer. He's assigned to the staff of foreign governors and generals. By foreign governors, I mean Romans who are governing a province abroad. And they're also responsible for minting money. And that's one of the perks. You get to design the coin in the year that you're quaestor. It's an, all of these are annual offices, so you don't get to serve more than a year. And this means that a lot of people can get elected. Once you've been a quaestor, you're in the Senate forever. So that's all you need to do to get in the Senate. And there are at its height 20 quaestors a year. So 20 people per year get elected and then they're in the Senate. And then that's how the Senate renews itself. Good for them. If you are a plebeian, you don't have to be a quaestor. You can instead be elected tribune. We've talked about tribune before. Um, most of the time, there are 10 of these. This changes over time, though, like, much like the American government. As time goes on, Rome gets bigger. They need more, so they add people to this. After you're a tribune, you can run for edile if you want to. So this office here, edile, or right here on our list, is optional because it costs the edile themselves a lot of money because you're expected to throw public games. So this is the official in charge of party planning. You plan chariot races, gladiatorial competitions, large public sacrifices, parties, festivals, that sort of thing. It has an unglamorous side too, though. It's also a public sanitation officer. So you're the party planning and bathroom cleaning committee of Rome. They're in charge of making sure that the sewer gets mucked out. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that they're climbing down into the sewer and mucking out the sewer. Oh no, we have enslaved people for that. But they're in charge of making sure that the sewer gets cleaned. So fully for them. Being an edile can bankrupt you or send you very, very deep into debt. But not to despair, 
your military career can help offset this. So this is a political career that people are often having parallel to a military career. So the years where you're not serving in these offices, you'll be off on a general staff serving as an officer and doing your military bit. Not everybody had a military career. Some people would instead be lawyers who took cases of people who needed a public defender and didn't have anybody who was willing to represent them they knew personally. If you were very good at this, you could get very famous because the law courts were public entertainment. People would show up and watch the lawyer's lawyer. A little bit like public prosecutors in a sense, but they're not working for the government as lawyers. It's all private practice. Okay. So after the optional EDAL ship, these next two are high prestige offices, and these are also offices with fewer people serving. The Praetor here, sometimes you'll hear British people pronouncing this Praetor, Praetor, both are okay, Praetor is better. Praetor is a judicial official. So this is somebody who sets schedules for court cases and decides the rules under which cases can access the justice system. And this is the first office with Imperium, the power of life and death, because if you're part of the judicial system, you have the power to sentence people to die. So that means you need Imperium. You need the state giving you the right to use violence to end somebody's life. And that also entitles you to special bodyguards, more about them in a minute. There are six to eight of these per year. This uh, diagram is a later one that has eight per year. It's fine. When you're done being a praetor, because you've already been given imperium, that means that the state now considers you perpetually responsible enough to continue to use imperium on the behalf of the state. So when Rome has foreign provinces that they're administering, they'll send an ex praetor or a pro praetor out there to be the new governor. And this is one of the places where you can make money back. So when you're on a military staff in your early career, the booty and the spoils of war that you keep privately you can use to pay back all of your election loans. At this juncture, when you're a provincial governor, you get to keep even more money. Even if you don't get involved in a war, you're still collecting taxes. And if you collect more taxes than you're supposed to collect, you don't give it back to the people you just taxed. You pocket the difference. Roman tax collectors were really unpopular because they needed to make a lot of money. And that's exactly what they do. So in a few years, you can run for consul. And as I said, there are two of them every year. They also have imperium. And when you're done being a consul, you go off as a provincial governor for an even better province. So pro praetors get medium income provinces, but the ex consuls, the pro consuls, they get the really good provinces with a lot of money, often in an active war zone, which means, well, if you lose, you're gonna look really stupid, but if you win, you get to keep large amounts of spoil. And you can ask Julius Caesar how this worked out for him. Very well until he got stabbed is how this worked out. There are a couple offices that aren't part of the regular ladder of promotion, the regular cursus honorum, and these are the dictator and the censor. So a dictator is a special emergency office of the state that can be activated in a time of crisis, crisis as defined by the Senate and the consuls. So if Rome is under threat of invasion or the government has become incredibly unstable, then the Senate can elect a dictator, which is a kind of temp king. A dictator only serves for six months because it's thought if it's a real emergency, it's going to be over one way or another in six months. And after six months, if you're not done, you're just going to have to step away from it because you're too close to a king already more about the office of the dictator at the end of this lecture, so stay tuned for that. 
these didn't happen very often, mostly. Censors were a regular office. Every five years, you'd elect one of these guys. He had to have served as a consul sometime in his past, and he had to be older and a person of an unimpeachable reputation. This was somebody who had to be adjudged as incorruptible because his job was to go through the list of who's in the Senate and to kick people out if they weren't worthy. So this was a position of high trust. They also ran the census, which figured out how many Roman citizens there are, and this would reallocate who got how much voting representation where, uh, it, not quite to the level of the modern American census, but the modern American census is based on Roman ideas of censusing. So the censor, as I said, would serve every five years. And he had to be somebody that couldn't be bribed into kicking the wrong people out of the Senate, and also somebody that when they kicked you out, you'd have to respect them for that decision. So the reasons you could get kicked out of the Senate were for gross immorality. So technically speaking, this would be like uh, taking bribes to execute people. That's not good. That would get you kicked out. Um, being way too slutty is a thing. Uh, Romans define this by stealing other people's wives kind of think about Lucretia and then you have your template for what this looks like in a Roman mind. So if you're that guy, you'll get kicked out. Um, Julius Caesar got around this by eventually getting himself made censor. Um, a lot of things went off the rails in the first century BCE. Uh, anything else I want to say about that? Nah, that's it. So one last thing about this diagram. You may notice that the dude on the top is wearing some fancy footwear and a really nice toga. The toga was the Roman citizen outfit. It's the Roman version of a business suit. And it was thought to be a uniquely Roman garment. It's cut in a long semicircular shape, which is what makes it different from the Greek hemation. If you were elected to an office with imperium, then you got to put a purpley red stripe around the edge of your toga, like this fellow is wearing here. And you also, if you got into the Senate, you got to wear these special red platform shoes. So these are uh, red booties, and they've got a nice thick sole so you look taller. So a uh, Roman senator is, uh, Dude in a fancy toga wearing a pair of snazzy heels. So I mentioned people with Imperium get to have special bodyguards, and that's where we're going next. So these bodyguards are called lictors. A not this kind of lictor. When I Google imaged it, I ran into this uh, Warhammer figurine. Uh, we're not talking about that, but I thought it was funny, so here's a slide. Uh, not giant bug aliens, rather. These fellows right here. These are Roman lictors from coins and little figurines. This fellow here is our fullest scale model. The lictor carries a ceremonial weapon that is an axe with a bunch of sticks tied around it with these special cable cords. This ceremonial weapon is called the Fosques. Uh, more about the Fosques in a slide ahead. The main thing is to look at the bundle of sticks here. It's tied, and then you've got the axe head sticking out. The symbolism here is that the axe is Imperium. The axe can take life. So this is a nod to the, the death part of Imperium. However, it's not just an axe, right? There are sticks around the axe that are tied around it, and these are meant to symbolize the rule of law. So it's not just that if you have Imperium, you can kill anybody. 
you can only kill people on behalf of the government for reasons the government sanctions. You can't kill them because they looked at you funny or they don't like your cat pictures or they looked at your wife weird. Even if they rape your wife, you have to take them to court before you kill them. And probably you should recuse yourself. But that's the idea of the Foss gaze. The Foss gaze is power bound by law and controlled by the state. And the lictors also symbolize this state-sanctioned violence, but also the need for protection of people holding imperium. If you're a consul, you get 12 of these lictors and they'll follow you around everywhere with their axie weapons. You'll notice, however, the lictor is wearing a toga. He's not wearing armor. And that's important because they're not armed military guards. You're in a political office where you're interacting with your fellow citizens. Armed guards are a thing that kings have, right? But a praetor or a consul is an elected official. They're a citizen and they're being protected by fellow citizens. So their bodyguards are wearing togas and carrying these weapons that are symbolic of state power. So the symbolism is a really big part of what makes your lictor your lictor, and also the optics of a lictor. You know that you're looking at somebody with Imperium because they've got these folks walking around with them at all times. If you're a praetor, you only get six. Provincial governors get to keep them too. So these are secret service agents for ancient Roman statesmen. Now about those Fosques, you've probably seen them before in other contexts, and I'll give you one. This is an American dime minted in 1936. If you look at a modern dime, you may notice, if you're an astute observer, that they no longer look like this. We're gonna get into the reasons why in a minute, but if you look at the side that doesn't have Lady Liberty with her little winged freedom hat on it, which is what this hat is, uh, that kind of squishy Smurf hat thing is the Roman cap of liberty. So when you were freed from enslavement, you'd be given this kind of hat to wear as a symbolism of your newly found freedom. So in the American Revolution and also the French Revolution to symbolize their freedom from the tyranny of England, they went around wearing this kind of cap, except of course for the millions of enslaved Africans who, well, you're familiar with the Civil War, we all know how that worked. Back then to this time, on the back, there's an ax, very uh, 18th century looking ax, but an ax nonetheless, with sticks tied around it. So this is the Fosques. And for early Americans, this was a way of giving their new state legitimacy. They're saying, we're like a new version of Rome. And like Rome, we're wielding power bound by the laws of the land. So we have power, but we're using it by the consent of the people. And we use this on our state symbolism right on up into the 40s. If you look at the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, he's sitting on a chair where the armrests are these. In Congress, on either side of the speaker's platform are these large Fosques. And that may have been slightly off-putting to you because of the other thing the Fosques were used for. Another new political movement that emerged in the 1930s in Italy. I'm talking, of course, about the fascist movement. So this is a commemorative stamp made in Germany when Mussolini and Hitler allied as the charter members of the Axis. And on it, we see two uses of Roman power symbols. One we haven't gotten to yet. So this stick with an eagle on top of it was eventually the Roman legionary standard. So that's a Roman symbol that Germany went with and took in a direction that nobody should ever take anything in. However, knowing the Romans, it, it kind of does fit the brand, which is why we should never be uncritical recipients of Roman stuff. Just because the Romans didn't doesn't mean it's okay, guys. 
On the other side, on the Mussolini side of the stamp, you may note an X bound by rods, the Fosques. This was the symbol used by the fascist movement in Italy, thus fascist Fosques, that, that's where that comes from. Because Mussolini was very unsubtly and deliberately trying to argue that, no, no, he was resurrecting the Roman Empire, except Hitler was doing it too, but Mussolini was like, they used it as a thing to bond over, I guess. And this is why America tries not to use this so much. Uh, like many things, the Axis ruined it forever. And uh, good riddance, frankly. So let's see. I already talked about the benches in the Senate House. The consul would sit at the front. And notice I said consul singular. What would happen is they'd switch off day by day. So you'd have one consul on Monday, and then the other consul would be there on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, the next consul, and so on, unless it was a time of war, in which case one of those consuls would become the field leader of the Roman army, and the other consul would stay home, unless things had gotten really bad, in which case both of the consuls would go into the field and lead the army. The commander-in-chief responsibility part of the consulship was very, very literal for the Romans more literal in many ways than in America. Roman presidents don't get killed in battle as much as Roman consuls tend to, not Roman, American presidents, Roman consuls. Why would I make that mistake? Okay, so this brings me to some other early American imagery. This is a statue of George Washington that, I'm not, is it still in the Capitol? I think we might've moved it because it's a little weird looking. So astute observers will notice, first off, that George Washington is shirtless here and looking awfully ripped for a man his age. I mean, no judgment, I guess that's possible, but I seriously doubt that he looked like that under the waistcoat. So why does this early American statue of George Washington look like this, you may ask? Uh, well, George Washington's political career, like many things in early America, was created and modeled on ancient Rome because Rome, or Rome, America's founding fathers were Livy fanboys. They were really big Rome fans and they used Rome as their founding idea for a lot of the features of the American constitution. But in a way where they thought they were fixing some of the bugs in the system. Many of the features of the American Constitution that don't look like the Roman Constitution we just took a tour of exist because the Founding Fathers were like, okay, so we want a situation like the Roman Republic, only we don't want it to break down and get taken over by an emperor, so let's try to fix the things that broke in Rome. Uh, however, one of the things that uh, came up early in America's history was that at the end of Washington's second presidency, he was faced with a choice of whether to continue on for re-election or to step down and allow a transfer of power. And he did that. He stepped down, Thomas Jefferson was elected second president of the United States, and at the time, Washington and Jefferson were from two different political factions, not the same political parties we now have, but they disagreed on a lot of stuff and they didn't have the same followers despite both being landowning slaveholders from Virginia. This was an important moment in America's constitutional history though, because this was a moment of great uncertainty. And nobody was sure right up until the point where Thomas Jefferson became president that America would successfully transition power. I don't think I need to point out to anyone in 2021 how uncertain transitions of power can be. So when George Washington stepped down, part of how he framed himself was through this Roman figure, a dude named Cincinnatus. And this wasn't Rome's first consul, this was Rome's first dictator. 
So what happened with Cincinnatus is that he was out plowing in the fields one day and Rome was under attack, which brings us to our next slide, actually. This dude here, this is a modern statue of Cincinnatus. It's from the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, who is named after this dude. And you'll notice in his hand, he is holding the Fosques, but lightly as if he's about to put it down. And then in his other hand, there's a plow. That's an important plot point. Here we go. Okay. So Cincinnatus, he's out plowing in his field in his work uniform. When the Roman senators come to him, including the consuls, and they're like, dude, Rome's under invasion. We need you to be our first dictator. And this was a moment of great anxiety because the office of dictator worried Romans. It was the closest thing they had to a king, and they were super um, cagey about pressing that button. But in 458, Rome decided it was indeed time to press that button. In fact, he did it again in 439. He leaves his plow in the field, according to legend and Livy, takes up his dictatorial powers, and then six months later, right on schedule, he puts down the Fosques and goes back, picks up his plow exactly where it was, which is not how agriculture works, but I guess this is how a story works. And then he goes back to plowing. And this was a moment that Romans fixated on because this was their positive example of how dictatorial power should work. Power should be something that a patriotic good Roman, a Roman who had the virtue of virtus, of manly control, should be able to step into power for the state for the right reasons, kind of like a reality TV contest, and then to walk away again for the right reasons and be cool with going back to his normal life, which is what Cincinnatus does. And this is why we have a city named after this random Roman dude. This was in honor of George Washington's actually stepping down as America's first president and allowing there to be a second president. So because of this, George Washington got called the American Cincinnatus, and that's why that shirtless George Washington statue existed. Cincinnatus. So at least for now, the Roman Republic is functioning. People are picking up and putting down power on schedule. Collective bargaining is allowing people to gain increasing access to power. As Rome expands, more people are able to become a part of this state. And this is going to be a stable functioning governmental system for quite a while, longer than America has been a country this works. But eventually, things change. Not for a few weeks, though. All right. Peace out. See you in the next lecture.